Okay, uh, welcome to week three <clears throat> of Domain Specific Languages of Mathematics. Uh, I will start with some uh, Jamboard um, presentation. So this is based on some slides that have been prepared before. And in the Jamboard, there is actually also a PDF of the slides so you can download if you want to watch them separately. So the first example is actually part of uh, chapter two. So I've been saying that each chapter corresponds to a week of the course. And here we have a little bit of a leftover from last week. So I will talk about one of the examples in uh, the one of the last examples in, in uh, chapter two. So limit of functions. And um, this slide is basically just uh, to remember the overview um, that um, the course goal is to approach mathematical domains from a functional programming perspective, to, to learn some functional programming for mathematicians and learn some mathematics for functional programmers. And uh, the focus is on making functions and types explicit, um, to distinguish between syntax and semantics, to uh, use types as carriers of semantic information to try to sort of get the computer to help with writing correct mathematics by keeping track of the types. And then to organize types and functions in domain specific languages. And uh, the specific uh, little slide presentation here is about variable binding and scoping. So not only is it important to keep track of types of functions, but also where they are defined and in what scope they are defined. Okay, let's move to the next page. So this is a quote from Adams and Essex, the calculus book used for uh, several programs at Chalmers and in many other places of the world. It's one of these bricks. It's uh, 1,000 pages, roughly. It's called Calculus, a complete course. And um, here is the definition of the limit of a function. And the way it's formulated, this is a direct quote, is on the slide. So say that we say that f of x approaches the limit l as x approaches a, and we write then this notation lim of f of x equals l when x approaches a. That's the little arrow believe below here. If the following condition is satisfied, and then comes something which is supposed to be logic. So it says for every number epsilon greater than zero, there exists a number delta greater than zero possibly depending on epsilon, I would say normally depending on epsilon, such that if, and then a condition, then x belongs to the domain of f, and this condition holds. And this condition is basically saying that the distance of f and, between f and x and l is small. So for any epsilon we choose, epsilon here could be one, but it could also be 0 0.1, or it could be one, uh, 10 to the power of minus 58. For every number, as small as we like, we can always find some delta such that within this range, the function is extremely close to L, as close as we like. OK, so that's, that's the definition. That is nothing very new here. Uh, let's see if we can, based on, on what we did, last week with logic, see if we can code this up or at least uh, express and type check and scope check it. So here I've taken the same definition and I erased most of the text and I've replaced some of the words with symbols. So I used for all and I used exists when those words were present. And then I've, I've kept a few words like such that if and then. And I introduced some notation. Uh, so we have DOM of f here. It's at the domain of f. So being in the domain of f means that it's a, it's a value uh, that f is defined for. So the function f is not necessarily defined for all x. But if x is sufficiently close to a, then it will be defined there. And this, this condition is just to check that we are actually allowed to compute the other part of the expression. So we cannot apply f to x unless x is actually in the domain of f. 
Anyway, so this is basically uh, um, fewer words, but still uh, spread out over the screen. So let's try to collect this up a bit. So I'm trying to define a notation. Here I call it lim AFL. And I try that as a predicate. So remember when I talked about predicates uh, last week, it's something which is either true or false in the end. So we don't a priori know if it's true or false, but if we give it a particular a, that's the point we're approaching, a particular function f, and a particular candidate limit l, then if this logical expression holds, we can say that l is actually the limit of f at a. So that's uh, only actually collecting uh, in a shorter form what we had on the previous slide. And now we can start to see if things make sense. So the first thing we'll do here is a scope check. So first of all, we define three variables. We pattern match on three arguments to lim on the left-hand side. These three are then clearly bound in the rest of the expression, so that should be fine. Then it might not be obvious, but for all, it's also binding. It's a language construct like the lambda expressions or function definition. So the name epsilon here is bound in the rest of the expression. So from here on. So epsilon is, let's, let's make little notes here uh, where they are bound. So A and F and L, they are bound at the left-hand side here. Epsilon is bound there. Delta is bound here. Okay, and then the, the definition of lim actually introduces another name. It introduces name P and applies that to epsilon and delta. So we have a local definition here of P of epsilon and delta. So we can say in the where clause, where we can have another color uh, for the scope there, then the epsilon, this epsilon, is a, the next binding for epsilon. And then this delta is the, the second binding of delta, but it matches up with the use up here. But anyway, strictly speaking, the epsilon and delta here have a scope, uh, which is then shadow by the epsilon and delta here. Okay, then let's try to check off what are the, the symbols we've got. So zero, just a constant, X. Okay, where is X bound? So if we check here, there, there, is, there is no place, there is no binding construct outside of here where the variable X is bound. Everything else, A, delta, F, L, and epsilon, all of the other symbols uh, are actually defined. I mean, now we're assuming that there is a predicate for uh, or a function to the main, there are the logic connectives and so on, less than, greater than, and so on. But the variables need to be all bound somewhere. And we can see that the x, which is used in three places, is never actually bound. So then we should perhaps look back at the definition in text and see what was going on here. So remember, I just tried to code up what was written here. And here we say, oh, Maybe uh, if we look at the text, the first thing is mentioned is an X up here, F of X. Maybe that is the X we're looking for, but that's not quite true either because we have a notation limit as X goes to A of F of X. And that X bound in the lim expression is only scoped over this part. It's not really used further down. So that's not it. Okay, then we can see we bound for every epsilon, for every, there exists a delta such that, and then this text or this expression in the text is the first use of X. So actually, this is an example of an implicit binding. When it says such that if, let's clean it up slightly by going to the next page. When it says on the next page, such that if, and then this expression, then we know already what A is and delta is, but we don't know what X is. 
So this is rather well hidden, but this is supposed to introduce a new variable x and then restrict its scope. Then we can ask ourselves, okay, is it, a, is it a function definition? Is it a for all? Is it an exist? Any suggestions? How is the x actually bound here? So an anonymous lambda, perhaps. Well, uh, I'm. It, it, it's not clear from from the text here, but for for the logic to make sense, if we look at the way it's written in the next slide, then we see there is this actually there is an implication here. So this means that the, the right hand side is true if this holds. So that that style that that sort of pattern is the same pattern as when we have for all epsilon greater than zero. So if it's greater than zero, then something else. So there is actually a hidden for all somewhere here. So this, this definition, the first attempt at translation um, does not work. I mean, we, we really need to, to insert another parameter somewhere. And the way we solve it is by adding a for all. So now I made a slight variation adding a binding for x. So notice what I've done here. I've still kept the first line of the definition with for all exist and p. And I've just added a for all of x before the rest of the expression. But just to show uh, that it's also useful often to have names for things, I've introduced a third uh, predicate a three argument predicate Q here. So we have, we're defining lim in terms of P and Q. So, okay, so, and the reason I'm doing this is very often when we need to reason about them, it's good to have names, good to keep track of which is which here. So let's see now, um, we have now solved the scoping problem with X, but let's also check the typing here. So what are the types of all these different parts? So first of all, we can ask ourselves, what's the type of limb? So I will write that here next to it in some way. So limb seems to be taking three arguments. A, which is supposed to be a point. Uh, so, well, maybe we should type F first. So let's, let's type F. So F is a function. It could be from real to real. So let's let's write, uh, whoops, now I slightly mistyped that. Let's put x to y here, where we assume that x is a subset of R and y is another subset of R. And the limit, the, the point we're going towards with the limit here, the A, um, should be, well, most often at least, it's a point in X. Um, it's point in X or the completion of X. It could be near X. So if X is all positive values, it could also include zero. So, okay, a value of type A is the first argument. And then this should be the F. So the next argument should be a function from X to Y. And then it should be an L. What kind of uh, type does L have? Y, yes, that sounds reasonable. So a Y, and then let's try to move this thingy a bit. Okay. And what does Lim return? What, what is the sort of the right-hand side of the whole expression? What type does that have? Yeah, bool is a suggestion. Uh, I would say perhaps it's more like a, um, it's a logic expression, a, a, a first order logic expression or, or a predicate. So, so uh, it's some kind of data type coding up logical things. So they can in the end be true or false, but we also have variables in and so on. So it's a little more general than just a Boolean. So this is, notice this is not something we can implement. So given 
uh, value x, a function f, and a point l, we cannot really mathematically or implementation-wise check if the limit is that, or at least not in gen the general case. But it's useful to try to keep track of um, the types anyway, so the arguments have types. Okay, and that also means if we try to be, if we try to move on a little bit, that means, for example, epsilon, we could say that epsilon, that's a a positive real number, it's an R plus, and actually also delta is a positive real number. Um, and that means that, for example, P, the type of P is R plus to R plus to fall, and so on. So in that way, we can try to keep track of the of the different types in the definition. So we, we should keep track, we should check that we got the scope right and we've got the types which match up. Uh, what, what did you say the delta x meant in Q epsilon delta x? Well, so delta, epsilon, delta, and x, they are just arguments to the predicate Q. So they're just uh, values um, when, when it's sort of instantiated to something. So here it's just variable names. So, so the delta is not applied to x or anything. So epsilon, delta, and x, yeah, we should see what the type of x is, but the type of, if we look at, uh, look at the expression here, so the type of x as it subtracts a from it, it should be the same type as a. So x is of type capital X, small x of type big X. Um, so the, it's not a delta x, there is a delta and there is an x. They are separate variables. But sometimes delta is used for other things, but here it's just different variables. Okay, so now we we done, I mean, basically mix, finished up with an expression which is, well, an expression, a, a logic statement, which we can then use to prove properties. And at this point, I should mention that we had to start out with the, another notation, which said limit as x goes to a of f of x equals l. This was what was used in the quote in the math books, math book. And it's maybe a bit dangerous here that we used the same word, same l-i-m, here and here, because as you may see here, it looks like lim is some kind of a function. It computes a value which then is compared with equality sign to L. But one of the tricky things here is that there is actually a bit of a lie in, in that mathematics notation. I mean, the, this not every function has a limit at a certain point A. So making this look like a function uh, or a value, an expression, which then can check equality with L is a bit of a um, abuse of notation. So we should rather um, have a predicate. If you want to be sort of more formal, we should have a, a three place predicate relating A, the function F and the limit L. And this, uh, this whole thing, the three argument thing is what we translate this lim to. And we'll go into the details of that, but I'll just stop and start the recording to get this separate part uh, uploaded separately. <clears throat>